Hi, I'm David Peppos, writer of the OZ, and you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic writer. He has been on the show before in the past, and we're here to talk about his next book in his ongoing series from the OZ. We're joined today by David Peppos. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Kurt. I'm excited to chat with you. It's been a year. When we talked, I don't know if the pandemic was just about to hit or if it was ongoing. I can't recall, but uh, how have you been? Good. I mean, boy, you know, time kind of flies um, when you're fulfilling Kickstarters and living in a pandemic. It, it, the OZ, our first campaign was, uh, it was an overwhelming success. Um, for those who haven't read our book, it's like, what if the Hurt Locker took place in the Wizard of Oz? Um, it's about Dorothy Gale's Iraq War veteran granddaughter who finds herself stranded in the war-torn land of Oz and how she becomes the leader of the resistance uh, as she uh, tries to find her grandmother's missing silver slippers in hopes of bringing peace to the occupied zone, or as the locals call it, the OZ. But you have another Kickstarter coming up. You have volume two of, yeah. of this series coming up. So let's talk about that. What, what's that all about? Anybody who's read my work um, knows that uh, the first issues are always the quiet issues with me. Now that we've established Dorothy, now that we've sort of established what led to Oz becoming this kind of magical battlefield. Now we're able to really kind of put pedal to the metal. We're able to kind of explore the world with some kind of dangerous new corners of the occupied zone, but we're also able to add in some new characters. We've got a really fun twist on the uh, the courageous lion that uh, is going to play a big part in the second issue. I think you guys are going to be really thrilled with that. Jack Pumpkinhead as the Scarecrow's uh, kind of fearsome lieutenant. He's going to be uh, playing a big part in this issue as well. And we'll get to see more with characters like Toto, uh, the Tin Soldier, and, and some other people in the land of Oz that uh, Dorothy is going to encounter. You know, this is kind of big and action-packed. The readers, they've had their vegetables. You know, I've already set up all the exposition I need. Now this is the dessert. Now this is the fun stuff. Lots of fun action. Lots of cool character development. Ruben Rojas, uh, our series artist and colorist, Whitney Kogar, they are just tearing it up. Um, they've had a year to really get to know each other and know each other's styles. And um, yeah, the, the end result is looking really gorgeous. I, I really do think the OZ is probably uh, one of the most beautiful books I've ever worked on. Yeah, like the preview I saw was was amazing. I love the, the action with it. Like it just popped off the page right away and... Uh... Uh, you're you're thrown right into the action in itself and i think that's just amazing to see just off the bat like it was just like wow i can't believe that like, you're a solid writer you the fact that you're taking this this fictional world that is beloved by the world over uh for its messages and its morals mm -hmm. you are now turning it into you know a, a true mythical battlefield as as you call yeah. it looking at the characters though that that you are working with, especially with its long-standing history and fiction. Yeah, uh, what are the ethics about using these characters in your writing? Sure. Though I think it's a great question because ultimately, it's so easy to just say dark, gritty reboot and turn it into kind of this edge lord fantasy. That's not what I'm about. I'm not for shock for shock value's sake. I think for me, it's always you know, is there something that I love about these characters and the archetypes they represent? And how can I stay true to that while sort of taking a, a darker, more adult twist on that? So, you know, for the, the case of the OZ, you know, it would be very easy to just say, oh, well, you know, this is John Rambo. You know, if anything, it's trying to find the themes that are inherent in the premise. Dorothy, you know, as a soldier, I think that that gives me a good platform to talk about uh, depression and trauma and PTSD and kind of the challenges that soldiers face when they're trying to reintegrate back into society. In another life, I was a newspaper reporter uh, before I was a comics writer. And uh, one of the beats that I covered was the local military beat. And so I would be interviewing a lot of returning veterans, asking just like, what is it like coming back home? And hearing kind of the differences in not having to be hyper vigilant all the time, but also sort of a world that is much less regimented and, must, and, and sort of with, with far less rules uh, about it. 
um, it's very disorienting for these people and, and can sort of result in a, in, a, in a feeling of depression, a lack of purpose, and also just kind of feeling like they've sacrificed so much and we don't get it. These are the kinds of messages that I'm trying to instill in all of my characters. That is how you know we can sort of approach it by saying leaving the characters better than we found them sounds pretentious. And that's not what I'm trying to go for. What, what I'm saying is, is taking sort of a loving remix of these characters in a way that um, I don't think is trying to be mean spirited towards the originals. It's not trying to take the piss out of it. Um, it's just, trying to honor them in a way that feels kind of like new and different with a different kind of tone to it. You have a new batch of characters you're working with in the second volume. Yeah. Which one of these was the funnest to write and which one was the most difficult? It's So it's funny. So the lion, I think, is the hardest for me to write. Um, that? Just because um, he's got a, his voice is very distinct and it's not, it's sort of the opposite of what I'm good at writing. Like he's he's got kind of a very formal voice to him um, a big in, in influence on him um, was uh, Chadwick Boseman's Black Panther um, you know I I had written I'd written this character uh, over a year ago so this was before you know any news of, of, of Chadwick passing um, and uh, so that was that was a challenging character but it helped that I think he's Ruben's favorite character to draw and so knowing like, okay, I know Ruben likes drawing this character. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm giving him some cool stuff to do. So Ruben is, is happy drawing him. I think my favorite character to write, besides Dorothy, I mean, Dorothy's sort of the voice that kind of anchors the whole thing. And that kind of voice is something that always really appeals to me as a writer. But um, Jack Pumpkinhead. Yeah, Jack is such a fun character, right? Um, I, a big influence for me on him was um, the comics version of Taskmaster. Uh, over at Marvel. I just love the idea of this kind of like blue collar mercenary with like a sense of humor, but he's like, he's not putting on any airs, you know, he's like very down to earth. And his voice, unlike the Lions, which was very, um, which was very formal, um, Jack was kind of like very informal. And so even in the scripting stage, all of his lines like keep popping off the page for me, just because, yeah, he's, you know, he, he, he he's the guy that sort of uh he leans a little bit into the absurdity of it all yeah seeing kind of his character and, and where he winds up it's really fun and i'm excited to see uh ruben drawing more of him uh as the series goes on you start off with action you you're fleshing out your characters uh, you know looking at this second volume what was the hardest scene for you to write I think for me, the always the hardest ones, the hardest scenes, believe it or not, it's always the exposition. I think that's something that gets harder and harder and harder each consecutive issue. Because not only do you have to introduce the premise, but you have to introduce what happened in the previous chapter, which gets more and more complicated. But you have to say it in a way as economically as possible and not repeat yourself from the way you said it before. There is a scene we had in our preview laying out like, the, uh, the, the silver slippers and what happened to them. And those, those are always kind of a challenge for me, just figuring out like, how do I say this in a different way than I did before? Um, you know, that's sort of, it, that, that's the vegetables of it all. It's just making sure that I can keep people up to speed. I will say emotionally the hardest scene, well, I don't want to spoil it. All I'll say is um, the end of issue three, or well, I guess sorry, chapter three. This is these are technically chapters three and four. The end of this first of this third chapter that was a hard one emotionally. I had to rewrite it a couple of times. I I, I really like how we 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 did it, and it's one of those things. Once the book comes out, you can ask me like, what was that supposed to be originally? I changed it in a way that I I needed to change it. Like just emotionally, I could not handle it the way that I had it before. And I think that the, it, it, it winds up being a stronger and maybe less alienating choice. That was definitely a challenging one for a lot of reasons. So just so I'm clear, the first book that we talked about was the very first volume, correct? Yes. So um, okay. I had written the OZ initially as six standard sized issues. And mm -hmm. then when I decided to go to Kickstarter, uh, you know, part of it was like, you know, I know Kickstarter has a higher price point than the direct market. And that's usually a question of scale and, 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 and all that. Uh, so I said, how can I sort of offer more bang for the buck to make that price point 
more justified. And I realized like, oh, I had already written six issues and they paired together really nicely. So uh, rather than killing myself with six Kickstarters, uh, then I can tell you, having done the uh, fulfillment on the first one, I was, I was really dragging hard by the end of it. And now I can just do three and it's a little bit more manageable and readers don't have to get confused over, did I get, you know, the fourth Kickstarter? Did I get the fifth Kickstarter? Now it's very much like, okay, one, two, three, we'll have catch up tiers on everything. People will know, okay, like, I, you know, I, I didn't check any of these out or I did check these out. I know where I'm at. When you're creating six issues and you have to restructure it under three, like. Yeah, there wasn't really any restructuring that needed to be done on my part anyway. They paired nicely. And that way I'm sort of able to add in like kind of cliffhangers in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, I think having that chapter break in the middle of the issue, I think it's a really valuable asset for this book. If we ever decide we want to collect it or anything like that, it's still nice chapter breaks so people can read it and not feel like oh this is exhausting they just know oh this is like kind of a meaty book instead of one that could be could have been really decompressed if i had done it the way that i had initially planned well yeah if you want to omnibus it then you you're set up to do so yeah that's exactly. what it boils down to and i and if you decide to go hardcover or whatever in the future you're set up exactly that. so it's a good future thinking especially for this type of series yeah and it's not like you're paying extra for colors or black and whites or whatever. It's all just there already right. done. So that works out. You know, it's, it's one of those things that it's like, somebody actually asked me today, uh, you know, do you plan on doing a collected edition? And, and the honest answer is like, we're still kind of focusing on getting the singles out. Um, and there's a whole different kind of calculus about what, you know, doing collections versus singles, especially with the Kickstarter market. So it's very early on, um, you know, I'm sort of like, once we have the second Kickstarter, hopefully funded and, 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 and fulfilled, that'll sort of kind of help inform us of what we're going to do for the last Kickstarter and if we're going to do anything after the third Kickstarter. Um, but yeah, it's just nice to sort of leave yourself some wiggle room, if at all possible. It, it helps me make some more decisions down the road. Editing a book like this or a series like this obviously takes a lot of time and effort yeah. <laughs> on your part. What did you edit out of this uh, particular book? Well, um, so the things that, that I edited, well, there, I mean, there's the, the script elements of it. I rewrote a significant portion of the back half of this Kickstarter. Um, I'm, I'm a lot happier with how it turned out. And then honestly, the third Kickstarter, there, there's a, there was a lot of rewriting I did. Uh, then I'm much, much happier with how it turned out as a result. Um, particularly chapter five. Chapter five was almost a top to bottom rewrite. Um, and uh, I, I think that was for the, the, the betterment of the series. But yeah, I spent a lot of time on this book. Um, it's honestly, it's sort of being the editorial conduit with all the other members of the team. Um, and thankfully I'm used to that. You know, um, my time at, uh, with Spencer and Locke and going to the chapel was very similar uh, over at Action Lab. And so, you know, I, I, I work with, all my teams on just about every pro part of the process. You know, I'm talking with Ruben about everything from panel layouts, um, just like how they stack on a page, to the thumbnails. He is uh, so gracious and 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 sweet when I when you know he'll he'll send me a panel and be like, "Hey, I have an idea. What do you think about?" And uh, he's very he's very good about that. We have a a very cool moment in uh, chapter three. He he did the first round of it. And I was like, "This looks okay, but what if we did this?" And he just turned around this dynamite looking image. Uh, you, you might see it in one of my teasers on, uh, on, on Twitter coming soon. You know, and Whitney Kogar, she actually does not need a, a lot of handholding. She kind of gets this series, I think, just in its bones. Um, every so often I'll be like, oh, hey, could we like tweak this color here and there? I've been really instilled for a long time. Like color is so important to these books. And it's often finding the right colorist but then also sort of keeping that colorist on the right path, you know, just making sure that like what they're doing clear for the book, but also elevating the artist and sort of making the, the line artist look good. And then even then I'm still editing my dialogue as we're lettering. I'm not the type of guy who's like rewriting whole pages. Um, like that seems very excessive, but Dave Hopkins has been a really sweet guy. in the fact that like, sometimes I tend to overwrite and I'm seeing it on the page and then I'm like, Oh, Dave, uh, I need to trim this balloon. 
I need to trim this caption. It's like, it's cluttering up too much of the page. And then even then, you know, I'm still reaching out to, to artists for, for covers, for pinups. Um, and that's kind of an interesting process in and of, in of itself. You know, you're trying to find new talent, people that you haven't seen before, but you're also trying to figure out like, okay, what are some uh, designs? that you can throw into the mix. And I feel like doing a good cover, especially one that kind of like tells a story, that's a really hard skill. And it's one that I'm still working on. Uh, but I feel like, um, you know, especially some of the the, the, the cover artists that I'm, I'm working with. We have Bon House uh, returning from our last Kickstarter. Uh, he was uh, far and away the most popular variant cover we had. He was out selling every other cover we had by like three to one. So, uh, you know, I, I made sure that Mon was coming back for round two. Um, we're joined by uh, Farid Karimi. Um, you might know him from Night Gwen. Uh, he's also doing the first issue of Luke Cage uh, coming out at Marvel soon. Um, he's, got, he's got a really terrific cover with um, our, our colorist Roche, um, who is just, it's, it's very cool. We're calling it, uh, I believe it's our Battle Royale cover. And then uh, Sem Iraz from The Pride. Um, I've been a big fan of Sem's for a long time. Uh, and he's doing a, an homage to a spectacular Spider-Man number 200, uh, but starring uh, the, uh, the Prince of Lions and uh, Jack Pumpkinhead. Oh, wow. So uh, that, that was a really fun cover that I've wanted to do for a very long time. And Sam just kind of knocked it out of the park. So um, yeah, I'm really excited for people to, to, to see all these covers together. And um, we will be offering tiers similar to last time where if you want to get all four covers, uh, we've got sort of a package set that'll offer you all that at a discount. Um, so yeah, and if you missed out on the last campaign, we still do have copies of all five covers of issue one, and we will be offering bundles that if you want to get all nine covers so far from the OZ, we will have package sets to get you all those. Looking at this pandemic, obviously from a creative perspective, it hit a lot of people in different ways. Yeah. How did it well, did it help or hurt you in your creative process? You know, it's a good question. I mean, and it's, it's, it's really, it's yes or yes and no. I mean, the pandemic was absolutely a reason why I finally took the plunge to Kickstarter. Um, uh, you know, I had friends like Charlie Stickney from White Ash and, and Russell and the Healthy um, from Cthulhu was Hard to Spell and Ryland Grant from Peacekeepers and, and The Jump. They were all telling me you should really do a Kickstarter. It's a whole different readership than necessarily the Wednesday warriors that are hitting up their comic shops every day. It's not to say there isn't some overlap, but there are a lot of people who just, no matter what you do, they won't go, you know? Um, they get their books primarily on Kickstarter or Amazon or Webtoon or, 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 or anything like that. Um, the pandemic was the, 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 the last kick, you know, that sort of made me think, okay, I really, I, I need to do this already. Um, you know, Diamond Heather shut down, a lot of publishers, you know, their acquisitions pipelines narrowed. And um, I realized like we could solve one problem with another. We can introduce ourselves to the Kickstarter community with these two issues of the OZ that I have finished and really introduce ourselves with our A game. Um, and so I think, you know, the pandemic, it's been, you know, there's certainly the existential dread um, that goes into it. And I, I channeled a lot of that into my book, Scout's Honor, um, you know, sort of the, the, the dread of the pandemic and the dread of the election. Um, that really went hard in that post-apocalyptic world. Um, the OZ was mostly written by the time that everything shut down. So that was sort of one thing off my plate. But um, yeah, definitely sort of the way that like we've been approaching it, especially in the art side of things. Yeah, you know, trying to hit that balance between like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you know, a gritty war story, but trying not to be like super oppressive you know, like remembering that like, there is a sense of adventure and magic and whimsy to all this. I mean, I know it sounds like me kind of having my cake and eating it too, but you know, not only are we sort of evoking, you know, actual war stories like, uh, like uh, Jarhead or, um, or American Sniper or, um, or Black Hawk Down, but we're also kind of evoking almost like a Star Wars kind of war as well, you know, sort of it's, it, it is a larger than life adventure story that happens to also tie into like, what are the ethics of all this? Uh, and what are the costs of all this? First off, like, I'm not Greg Rucka, you know, who, that guy like lives and breathes all the detail of this stuff. And that explains why books like The Old Guard or even his work on Batwoman, you know, they, they feel so textured, you know, you can feel like the grain in every page. 
Um, I, I, I'm not that skilled. I'm not Greg Rucker. Um, but I think we're able to take those real world elements and then we're sort of able to extrapolate them on sort of a hyper realistic, uh, you know, world. And then we're able to sort of find it somewhere in the middle, you know? Um, and I think that kind of opens us up to a broader readership. Um, you know, there's the readers who they get the details that we're throwing into the mix and they appreciate them, but you don't have to have, like be a Tom Clancy reader, you know, or you don't have to be like super into military history to be able to understand and appreciate the OZ. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see um, certain authors' takes on on based on their own personal experiences or based on who they they've interviewed or talked with to to expand their writing expertise like like what you have done. I honestly I consider myself really fortunate that like not only has sort of my personal background kind of lended itself to a story like the OZ, but I also you know even just the craft of it all. You know, I've been really fortunate. I mean, I've been on sort of in some capacity involved in the industry now, um, almost 15 years. And um, it's been nice sort of being able to kind of grow up alongside seeing these writers that I really admire and really respect and being able to not just learn from them, but to actually be able to talk to them and really kind of, uh, you know, get some knowledge firsthand. And I think that also extends to the Kickstarter field. Um, you know, I, I, I can't thank somebody like Charlie Stickney enough. Um, you know, if you haven't read his book, White Ash, you really owe it to yourself to do so. But Charlie is kind of the, the I, I consider him the top Kickstarter success story in, in terms of comics. You know, he's, he's a guy who has built up his fan base. And then he took his book also to Scout and wound up doing really well over there as well. Uh, you know, granted, I don't have plans with any direct publishers at the moment, uh, direct market publishers, let's say just because I'm kind of focusing and getting the book out through Kickstarter to our Kickstarter backers. They're, they're my top priority over anything else. Um, but to see that like Charlie has really kind of gotten Kickstarter down as a, as a science. And it really is. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much a different world than the direct market with its own unique laws of physics that I'm still learning. And having creators like Charlie or, or Ryland, uh, you know, or, or Russell, um, or Pat Shand, for example, um, really prolific on, on Kickstarter. Um, having those creators, you know, be so generous with their time and their advice, I think that's part of the reason why the OZ has, has been as successful as it has been, is uh, I've been really lucky to be able to kind of stand on the shoulders of some giants. Are, are you uh, an avid reader yourself? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things, I, I, boy, I wish I read more for pleasure. It's something that I... Uh, I'm trying to sort of eke out more time for, but you know, it's 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 one of those con, con, converse kind of things where uh, you, the more work you do, begets more work, which begets less time for you to do anything else. But yeah, you know, I mean, I'm constantly. I mean, I do pride myself. I keep up with the industry. Um, you know, I, I'm 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 reading just about everything that kind of catches my eye. Um, I can tell you uh, this morning, I just read um, the next issue of. Um, the six sidekicks of Trigger Keaton, uh, which if you haven't read that over image, it if it's not the funniest comic in the direct market, I'm not sure what is. Um, it's like it's like a Danny McBride show uh, oh, comic, wow. and I, I feel like not enough people are talking about it. So Kyle Starks is like the guy who's he's so funny, and I can't believe more people aren't talking about him. Um, he's definitely he's like what Al Ewing is to sci-fi, but he's that for comedy and comics really really smart guy um i'm reading everything that al ewing's doing i'm reading uh, uh everything that hickman's doing on the x-men books um I, I i say this in all the podcasts but it's just like hickman's x-men got me through the pandemic you know i mean it's this it, finding something that was so forward thinking and so ambitious um in a time where like i was sort of like struggling to put one foot in front of the other you know, um, and it's nice to sort of be able to bury yourself in your work, but it's really nice to be able to see that like, oh, there's somebody who's like really blazing some trails and really lighting the way for the rest of us. Um, James Tynan's doing some really cool stuff right now. Um, you know, his, his Batman work feels really additive. Um, the Department of Truth feels really thoughtful. Um, nice House in the Lake is really fun. I love sort of how experimental he, he is with the structure on that one. Um, you know, I, 
I'm sure there's a few other books that are, are sort of springing to mind. I will say the other night I did a, a late night reread of um, the first, I think, three or four trades of Spawn. Oh, wow. You know, that was, I, I read those when I was a kid. I, you know, I, was, I, was, I was 12. And it really kind of reminded me, like I had those feelings of when I was 12 of being like, oh, this is the, like the coolest thing in the world. And uh, yeah, like, you know, I'm, my, my sensibilities have changed a little bit since I was 12, I, I, I would hope. But um, just, ha- you know, rereading those books that I loved as a kid, it was really invigorating and just kind of reminded me like why I'm doing this. And also kind of made me feel kind of proud at just kind of how far I've come in those uh, almost 20, or in those 20 plus years and, uh, you know, how much further I have to go. Looking at the amount of authors that, that you even just talked about, were there any uh, any comic writers or authors that you didn't like at first, but they grew upon you? You know, the writer who I will say that I've appreciated watching their growth over the last the last few years, honestly, uh, James Tynan, I felt like there was a real sea change to his work uh, when he started writing Detective Comics. And I think he's kind of jumped to another level um, since Something is Killing the Children. Uh, and, you know, or Department of Truth, whichever you, you kind of want to break it down at. I remember reading his first work, you know, I remember reading uh, his work on, on Talon. And, you know, looking back at it, you, you know, at the time, while that, that book wasn't for me, I kind of, now looking back, I can't help but admire it, admire him for it anyway. You know, he was really young. I mean, he was, I think, maybe fresh out of college. If that, he may have still been in college when he was working on it. Um, at a much higher level than I think most first-time comic writers should be doing this. And yet he was able to really acquit himself in a way that I think a lot of first-time comics writers would not have been able to do. Um, and seeing like, you know, he worked on a, on, a, on a yearly, at least one yearly series. It might have been two yearly series. And I feel like that was where you could see him like he was really putting in his wraps. And um, I know he was offered, you know, a, as Scott Snyder's protege, I mean, that, that was offering him opportunities that, of course, 99.9% of, you know, aspiring comics pros wouldn't be able to do. But the fact that he's been able to maintain his longevity and the fact that he's been able to keep improving as a creator in really dramatic fashion and the fact that he hasn't cracked, you know, I think that's something that we don't really talk about a lot in the industry is um, it's a lot of pressure. You know, there's a lot of internal and external pressure. And I think it's very easy to let that get to you. Um, And the fact that James has been doing this now, he's been writing since, I guess his first book. So he's been at this for what, a decade now? Mm -hmm. And he's been operating at a pretty high level of of talent with a a pretty high level of frequency. And um, the fact that he's been able to do that and kind of, stay at that level of quality and not kind of just lose it or turn into a jerk. I think that's, um, that's really admirable of him. And, um, and uh, I think that is yet another reason why I've been really enjoying his work. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? It's a great question. I'm going to flip that a little bit because for me, it's been less of a specific moment and more of kind of a general theme for, for, for me. I, this, is, this is not something I really talk about a, a ton on interviews, but you brought it up. And so I think it's, it's, worth, it's worth discussing. I, I was speech delayed as a kid. Um, I, I didn't talk for a while. I was, pretty, I was nonverbal for, for a while. Um, thanks to some really wonderful speech therapists and occupational therapists, I, I was sort of able to kind of rewire my, my language centers a little bit and, and now be very verbose, as, as you can probably tell. But I've been told, you know, my, my whole life, if only you knew what it was like when you weren't talking and realizing that that's, that's kind of how you connect with people. You know, uh, I, I think, I think language is such a, a powerful tool. Um, and, and like many powerful tools, it can be used to, to help and it can be used to hurt. And I think, you know, if anything over the last five years, I think we've been seeing exactly how much language can hurt people um, and, and, and hurt the world around us and really kind of um, rewrite the rules of the world, you know, um, and, and, and often kind of unsettling and, and, and painful ways. I think for me, learning how to write and learning how to master that, I think that's sort of 
the end cap for a theme I've had my entire life of sort of going from someone who could not express themselves to someone who kind of learned how to do it on a basic rudimentary level. Now I'm sort of doing it in a way that I think is, you know, being able to create is I think one of the more powerful ways that you can use language. I, I think it's very easy to see creating as magic. And I think I have learned through my experiences that no, it's, it's, it's work. Um, it's a process. It's sort of, it's, it's repeating and failing and repeating until you succeed. And uh, I think it's something incumbent upon creators. It's something that I think more creators should be doing is trying to demystify the process for people. You know, I mean, this is not, this is not witchcraft. Okay. This is building a chair and everybody builds a chair in their own different way, but there's a structure to a chair. You know, you got the seat, you got a certain number of legs, you know, maybe you've got a back to it. You can build it in any way you want with whatever materials you want. And it's yours. I always think sort of, you know, how could, how, you know, a sliding doors moment, you know, of uh, what my life could have looked like. Um, and I think as a result, it's really kind of made me redouble my efforts um, towards making words my life and making words my livelihood. From that part of your life to this, what was the first thing that you wrote that made you realize, yes, I can do this as a career? So there's a couple of instances that I had. In high school, I wrote a one-act play that was pretty heavily inspired by, uh, by Bill Williams' fables. It was a detective story sort of in, in, in that vein. It was a whodunit, uh, almost in the vein of Spencer and Long. I wrote it and I wound up directing it as, a, I think as a junior or maybe a senior in high school. I was not ready for the response that that was going to get. I, I was shocked at how much people liked it. And I, I remember uh, my parents, my mother specifically, I think like a light bulb went off way before me. She was like, you should be doing this for a living. You, you really should be doing this for a living. I tried a whole bunch of stable jobs and uh, I didn't love them. You know, I worked in journalism, I worked in publicity and PR, I worked as a Hollywood assistant. Um, I, I was not, they were not great jobs for me. I was not a great fit. But in my newspaper job, especially, I took some time and I would write a short script every day. Um, and it's because I was moonlighting at Newsarama and I thought, well, you know, if I learned how to write a script, I'd be a better reviewer. And then maybe also I'd have a future in the industry. I was thinking as an editor at the time. Um, and uh, as I started writing scripts, I slowly got better at it. I wrote a short script every day and I realized like, well, if I just finish it, I'll learn what I screwed up. And then I can apply that to the next one. I think though, the thing that made me think like, could I do this professionally? Honestly, it was Spencer and Locke coming out um, and people not hating it. Um, I think once the trade came out and the dust settled and I was like, okay, I didn't get run out of the industry for turning one of comics most sacred cows into hamburger. I think that's the moment I kind of gave myself permission to, to really make a run at this. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. When did your life change for the better? You know, there's a few answers I can give here. Uh, you know, meeting my partner, um, you know, she's, she really, um, changed my life and I, I think in some very profound ways um, particularly you know encouraging me to write um, you know I, I, I started writing uh, I really picked up my writing again um, uh, trying to impress her she's a voracious reader she's not a comics fan but she just likes reading fiction and I think you know she liked the idea of her boyfriend being a writer and so I was like well I guess I'm going to do that um, you know my first book coming out um, you know, I think like, like I was saying that that was the first time that I had a job that I was like, oh, I feel like I'm, I could be good at this and good at this in a way that I didn't feel like I was constantly compromising or on the back foot. I'm sure you can relate to this to, you know, to being, uh, you know, a busy interviewer, but um, the only other job I ever felt anything like my comics job was when I was the reviews editor at Newsarama. And even then, while I felt very good about what I was writing and what I was editing, I still felt constant guilt that I could never cover everything I wanted to cover. Um, that, that invariably there were going to be worthy books that wouldn't get covered. So I always felt like I was doing like 80% of a good job on that. And uh, comics, it's sort of, I felt like I was like, no, like when we leave it all out in the field, you know, I feel like we've done the right thing. 
you know, and I, I could go to sleep at night feeling good about the work. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, those are those are sort of the, the 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 two instances where life was getting better. I, I will say the the most recent one, honestly, um, it was getting our puppy Ruby. Uh, we we got her, um, we got her the Saturday after the OZ's books were delivered to my apartment. Um, so I, our first few weeks of having her, I was, I was packing books nonstop, but, um, you know, we, we had a fairly rough go of it, um, you know, leading up to that, you know, uh, we, we had a, a pup with, uh, with cancer, um, who, who passed shortly before everything shut down with the pandemic. So that had been about a year. Well, I guess it had been almost two years of kind of some degree of personal stress going on on top of trying to do the work and just trying to live your life. And uh, when we got Ruby, uh, you know, it was kind of nice seeing the world through her eyes a little bit. You know, I mean, she's, uh, she's almost a year. Um, she's very excited. She's never met a person she didn't love. And um, she's so loyal to us. And she's so not just protective of us, but she, you can tell she wants to be an entertainer. And so she works really hard to sort of, uh, you know, if she feels like the house is too quiet, she'll, she'll try wrestling or she'll try stealing something. Uh, mischief is her favorite game. Hmm. And, um, you know, it was the first bit of normalcy in, you know, it, what has been a year and a half that has not felt particularly normal, you know, or in, in my case, it was really two and a half years that hadn't felt normal. And um, yeah, I think, you know, having, having Ruby, our, our, our pup, um, you know, it's just so easy to kind of just say, well, all you're gonna do is, is live for work. And I love my work, don't get me wrong. I, I do love my work quite a bit, but it's just nice to kind of have something extra in your life that has nothing to do with your job. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, I think all, of, all, of, all of those things, I really think the, uh, the highlights of, uh, of my life so far. Out of all the people you've talked with over the, over your decades yeah. of doing this, not only as a journalist, but also as um, a person looking into Kickstarters and getting advice from those seasoned professionals, mm -hmm. what is the wisest thing that someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you? I think the best thing that I was ever told, and I'm pretty sure it was Greg Pak who told me this, when you start out, you have to give yourself permission to suck. That really kind of opened my eyes. I think that was the big, important first step for me. There are some people who are naturally gifted at this, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's great that, you know, um, you know, they, they can be Michael Jordan. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a five, eight white Jewish guy. I'm not dunking anytime soon. Hearing somebody as accomplished as Greg saying that like, oh, I didn't start out talented. Like I had to write some really crappy stuff and then I got a little better at it. And then I got a little better at it. And then I got a little better at it. And I kind of realized that's part of the reason why I was doing a script every day for, for, for 90 days is I was just like, oh, I don't have to show this to anybody. This is just like, get, these are just put in my wraps. You know? um, I will say the other good bit of advice, it's weird talking about him, but it's, I guess the broken clock is right twice a day in this case. Um, there, was a, there was a quote that Joss Whedon said, um, where he said, when I write, it's dessert first. And I think that's been very helpful for me. Um, dessert first meaning, just because a reader consumes your work sequentially does not mean you have to construct it sequentially. And so if there are particular scenes that pop out at you for a, a particular concept, I write those first. And then I kind of work my way backwards with, with the more challenging stuff, the connective tissue, or figuring out how I'm gonna get from point A to point B or figuring out like what's the exposition. That's usually one of the last things I'm writing in, in the mix. Um, but that really helps me build my momentum uh, in, in a big way. And it also helps me figure out the viability of a concept very quickly. Because if I write, you know, all I've got in, in my back pocket is two scenes, then I haven't wasted a lot of time knowing, okay, this, this property, this, this project idea is not very viable. Um, but usually that's sort of the, the get up and go I need. And then everything else gets a lot easier because you see, oh, it's not just a blank page anymore. You've got scenes. Now you just have to kind of connect them together. 
So I think those are those are probably the two big pieces of advice that I think about pretty regularly. I like that. It's it's always curious to to hear either past mentors or or people that you admire, you know, give that nugget of wisdom that just really kind of yeah. gives you that push that you absolutely and need to. I, I encourage people to, you know, I mean, really look up a lot of people because honestly, I mean, that's the secret about process is it's it's not one size fits all by any means. And so somebody listening to this is going to be like, oh yeah, he's right on the money. And somebody else can be like, that guy's dumb. That's nobody talking. About. And so being able to sort of, um, you know, you hear it and then you just see if it resonates with you. And I think that's what kind of helps uh, diversify everybody's voice and style uh, in, in such a cool way. What is one mistake that you will never do again? One mistake that I will never do again is count my chickens before they hatch. I've had projects that um, either kind of fell through when I was expecting them to, to be a thing or the timeline was much longer than I expected it to be. Thankfully, none of those have sort of blown up in my face in, 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 in any particularly big way. But I think, you know, just making sure like the comics industry, nothing's a sure thing until it's on the stand. You know, uh, there's just so much that can happen at any particular time either behind the scenes or just anything, you know, you know, popping up, just, you know, you know, your distributor could go under, your distributor could be, you know, put on hiatus. And so that's why I just kind of, you know, enjoy, enjoy the work while you're doing it. But, you know, I, I keep things pretty close to the vest now. Um, you know, even you can see in my newsletter, uh, pep talks, you know, I refer to projects by pseudonyms because you never know what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I, it's much easier to sort of put a synonym on the shelf than it is to be talking about like a fully fledged project that something happens and it doesn't go through. Is there anything as we're wrapping up, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to share with those that are listening, right. watching the show? You know, I think the big thing that I, I just want to reiterate to everybody is, you know, especially for Kickstarters, every backer counts. That's the cool thing about Kickstarter is we're ranked in the algorithm based on how people, how many people back us. This is probably a terrible thing to say as like a professional writer, but I don't care about the sales numbers. That's really not my, my thing because ultimately at the end of the day, every cent I make is just going to go towards another project. But for me, it's about the readership. How can we build that readership? I, I encourage anybody, you know, um, you know, tell your friends, you know, feel free to share any of our links. Uh, you know, if you know somebody who might be interested in it, uh, you know, send them the Kickstarter link. The other thing I, I'll say is that uh, because I want everybody to feel valued in this, you know, because again, I get it. Kickstarters are not cheap. Every single tier has a digital PDF of Spencer and Locke number one and going to the chapel number one. Uh, just so like you feel like you're getting something out of backing us. And then, you know, once you start, I believe it's on the $10 tier, you get, you know, uh, you're, you're getting a PDF. Of, of the issue and you're getting behind this you're getting a script uh, of the issue and you're getting the untouched inks and the untouched colors for all of that so we're trying to make sure that everybody feels like they're getting some bang for their buck and that's before stretch goals um you know I'm, i i've got fingers crossed we had some really cool stretch goals last time and uh you know if you liked our enamel pin last time you might want to tell your friends to keep backing us uh if you liked our stickers or our prints from last time you might want to tell your friends to keep backing us the last time I was kind of caught off, off guard, to be honest. You know, we, we funded so much faster than I ever expected. The rest of the campaign was me kind of keeping up to see what we could do. I've had a year to prepare. So we've got some cool stuff in store. Uh, and we just hope that if we build it, the readers will come. So, um, so yeah, if, you're, if you have any interest, feel free to check out our Kickstarter page at uh, bit.ly slash the OZ comic. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh, um, my partner, 100%. Uh, yeah, no, my, my girlfriend, Claire, um, I don't think I'd ever have become a writer without her. Um, I, 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 I owe my career to her. And uh, yeah, just an uh, all-around uh, inspiring and, 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 and wonderful person to have in my life. From a professional standpoint, you are now on to your second Kickstarter. You, oh, wow. I'm, you've done many Kickstarters in the past before, but this is one that I'm looking forward to, and I'm sure you are as well. And you've written, of course, many comic books in the past with 
Spencer Locke and going to the chapel and of course the OZ and Scouts Honor. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I'm shocked at how far I've been able to come. Uh, and I think of a, a, a relatively short time. Uh, I feel so grateful. You know, uh, I know what a privilege this is to, to, to get this far. And, um, and there's more stuff down the pike coming. Um, I, I feel so lucky and I feel so fortunate. And I think that speaks to not just the hard work that I've put in, but the hard work of my collaborators, you know, um, Jorge Santiago Jr. from Spencer and Locke, Gavin Guidry from Going to the Chapel, uh, Luca Castellan Guida from Scouts Honor, and Ruben Rojas uh, from, from the OZ. Um, yeah, I consider myself really fortunate um, to, to have been able to enjoy the success and, 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 the, and the track record that I've been able to enjoy. And um, yeah, it reminds me that like, even on the hard days, you know, whether there's setbacks or you're not getting the workout that you want to get out or, you know, you're, you're, you're stressing about a deadline, you just remember like, you know, I feel like an astronaut right now. This is my astronaut job. I'm, I'm walking on the moon every day I get to write a script. And uh, it, it, it sure beats digging ditches. So yeah, I consider that a, an overwhelming success. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell 12 year old me uh, what was in the future. He'd be, he'd, be, he'd be losing it. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? As privately as I can. Uh, you know, it's, it's so easy. And I think this is a little bit what we're talking about, but like the pressure, not like getting to your head. It's so easy, especially in a, in a hyper-connected social media world to just like ruin your career with a tweet. You know, I, I, I think it, it's very easy in this business, especially where like the professional etiquette can be kind of the wild west, you know, um, for me, whenever I deal with setback, it's, I, you know, I have a few trusted friends that I, you know, I will shoot a message off to, to vent quietly. You know, I can vent to my, I can vent to my therapist, you know, I like, I, I, uh, I think that is sort of the best way to kind of deal with it is just, you know, it's so, I think we're so used to having to be online and be performing online all the time that like, oh, you can just kind of, you know, lick your wounds quietly and, I think, you know, it's never a pretty sight. I mean, I, 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 I'm sure there are some people who deal with setback very stoically in, 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 in public. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like a painful way to live. No, like, you know, just, just you know, get, get your, your ugly tears out in the privacy of your own home. Um, I think beyond that, like, I, I just try to learn from it. You know, um, there, have been, there have been moments where I'm like, oh, okay, I'm realizing like I just didn't have the professional experience to know oh, this is the way you should have done it. Um, and thankfully, like, I'm not, I'm never trying to come across as a jerk to anybody. So I don't think I've ever like stuck my foot in my mouth, like in a really bad way. But, um, you know, you just learn from it and you kind of have to really weigh that calculus of like, is the person that is sort of giving me this, this, this setback, you know, are they doing it out of malice? Is it for my own good? Is it for their own good? And then you can kind of figure out like, all right, does this setback mean this is a, a project that doesn't work? For example, Spencer and Locke, I can tell you that was, that was born out of failure. I pitched that all over the place and nobody took it. Um, and, you know, it, I could have just rolled over. I could have just said, yeah, all right, I guess, you know, we got turned down by, I don't know, the publisher, you know, it's never going to happen. Or it lets you redouble your efforts and you say, no, I believe in this. And just because this person doesn't believe in it, doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. Um, and I think that's a calculus that a lot of people have to go through on their professional journeys, you know, making sure that like something, you know, is of professional quality and isn't going to be problematic and hurt people. You know, um, these are two things that a lot of publishers nix a lot of ideas over. Um, and as long as you are not one of those two things, then you, you, you let setback and failure be your fuel. Um, so I think yeah, I think that's the way I tend to approach it. The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether they've read the OZ, whether they've read Scouts Honor, Spencer and Locke, and going to the chapel, and I'm sure many more that you're going to create in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think it's just, it's, it's, it's doing the work and learning from it and then being um, generous 
with that advice and generous with that time. Um, I, I, you know, I think the comics industry mostly is pretty good about being generous with their, uh, with, with their time and advice. I, I remember chatting with a couple of people um, or asking a couple of people if they wanted to do like a process interview and then kind of being like very guarded about their, like their process, like it's some sort of like, you know, KFC secret sauce. I, I don't know if that's, that's not a really helpful way to go through things. So I think, yeah, inspiration is just sort of, you know, answering questions as people ask them. And I think that's part of the reason why I love doing interviews so much is I think, you know, none of this knowledge should be like a state secret. You know, I mean, it's hard enough to put it into practice, but being able to just explain it to people, um, I don't know. I, th I think, you know, some inspiration is through doing the work, but then some inspiration comes from explaining it and explaining how you got there and sort of, you know, watching the gears turn in the next generation as they kind of figure out, you know, if they really like Spencer and Locke, what's their Spencer and Locke going to be? You know, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see that that generation come up. And I, 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 I'm hoping that someday, you know, there'll be that next generation of readers who find some inspiration in my work. Well, I do hate to say this, David, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You know, as always, time flies with you, and uh, I had a blast. I can't wait to see, you know, this Kickstarter. I can't wait to see the, the you know, the volumes that you're you're created now with these two um, chapters, and then you, you know, the following Kickstarter. I'm sure we'll definitely have you back on. We'll, we'll dive I, into those as well. I, I appreciate you, you know, chatting with me, Kurt. It's always a pleasure to catch up. And yeah, anybody who's who's listening to this, uh, you know, if you want to follow me on online, um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Peposti. It's my last name, first initial, or David Pepos Comics on Facebook. You can subscribe to my newsletter, Pep Talks, at bit.ly slash pep news. Uh, and you can visit my website at davidpepos.com. Uh, and we'll, you know, we will be selling copies of all my books on my website. And also, if you decide you want to wait for the Kickstarter, we will have a backer kit store on the back end. So you will be able to buy uh, any of my work uh, a la carte. Perfect. I didn't even have to ask about social media. You just jumped right into it. I love it. Uh, as I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find David's other interviews as well as uh, a thousand other plus interviews over the last 12 years since 2008 on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented, creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.